I just want to say thanks to everybody who's joined us tonight. I'm sure this is absolutely the best use of Valentine's Day that anyone uh, could possibly uh, imagine. But it is seriously really good to be joined on this call by trade unionists from right across the UK, from right across the TUC's family of unions. And Heart Unions Week is our opportunity to celebrate trade unions, to celebrate the difference that unions make day in, day out in workplaces up and down uh, the country. It's a week where we can share our pride of being union members and activists with our friends, our family, crucially with our workmates. Now, we've got a fantastic panel of speakers uh, who will be talking to you over the next hour uh, or so. Maybe before I introduce our first speaker, just say three things that I think hopefully uh, people will take away from this call this evening. First of all, we want everyone on this call, everyone in your branch, everybody back in your workplace to go out and talk to someone who's currently not a member of a union and ask them to join. Because we know it's a stronger growing trade union movement that influences employers, influences governments and actually allows us to deliver on the priorities that matter uh, to working people. Second thing I'd say is that that's every union rep on this call to ask themselves, what can I do to build a more diverse, more representative trade union movement? How do we bring through that next generation uh, of reps? How do we get more young people, more black workers, more women into activists' uh, roles? Now, I've got nothing against uh, older white blokes. I am one uh, myself, if you notice. But you know, I, absolutely, it's the case. We need not only a strong trade union movement in this country, we need a genuinely diverse and representative uh, movement, because that's the sort of movement that delivers uh, for working people. Last but not least, I'd ask everyone on the call to use the Heart Unions hashtag, let people know about this call. Most importantly, let people know about anything you'll be doing this week in your community, in your workplace to mark Heart Unions uh, Week. So listen, we've got a lot to get through in the next hour uh, and a little bit. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Christina McInerney, the General Secretary of the largest union in the country at uh, Unison. And Christina is someone who spent a lifetime organizing, supporting, speaking up uh, for public sector workers, particular uh, low paid women workers in the NHS, social care and beyond. And I'm absolutely delighted that we got Christina to kick us off. So over to you, Christina. Thanks, Paul, and uh, good evening, everyone, um, and happy Valentine's Day. I'm sure all of us are delighted to be here, and that, actually, I am. It's del I am delighted to be here. It's it's actually great to be here celebrating what we all love about unions. Uh, but thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight and about some of the the things that we've been doing in unison uh, and what we secured for workers over the past two years. Um, you know, Hearts Union Week is such an important opportunity for us to focus and celebrate on the wins of our entire movement. Because when so much of our work on campaigning to change things that are going wrong, and we all know there's lots of things that go wrong, we often forget to make a noise about our wins and the great work that unions do. And, uh, you know, like so many unions, Unison's no stranger to winning campaigns. You know, throughout COVID, we had a, an absolutely relentless focus on safety in the workplace for our members, constantly renewing the information and advice, constantly talking to employers, constantly talking to governments across the UK on what was what was happening and what needed to change to keep people safe. We all know that COVID has been one of the biggest industrial challenges we've all faced. And, you know, as well as being able to make sure our members were able to work safely, we did that because this wasn't just about our members, but about the people who depend on the services that they provide. So if we kept them safe, if we kept our members safe, they were more likely to be able to continue to do the services they do and keep up members of the public and the people who rely on them safe. Uh, whether that was in, uh, in healthcare or in education or social care or in other essential services where our members work like policing or in energy supply or in the environment uh, agencies across the UK. Um, so in the first year in lockdown, that was pretty much the, the focus was, all, was on all of that. And during the second year of the pandemic, uh, it's almost unbelievable to think we've been living this for two years. But as the vaccine began to roll out and when further waves of the pandemic hit, uh, we supported our exhausted members as they were asked to do more and more in response to COVID. And exhaustion was the word that came through time and time again when we spoke to our members, particularly in health and social care. Um, and 
I'll give you one example. Our survey of health staff found that two thirds of staff had experienced burnout during the pandemic and felt overwhelmed after long, intense shifts. And it was a Unison member, uh, who an NHS nurse, who administered the very first COVID-19 vaccination, a, a really positive message within our union, uh, and to, because we use that to help encourage more members to get vaccinated. And we've used that as well because we firmly believe in persuasion, not coercion. So we campaigned relentlessly against mandatory vaccines, along with other unions. And I'm really pleased that we, and I do believe it was the work that we as unions did that forced the Westminster government to U-turn on their plans to extend it from the care sector to the NHS. Uh, and, and even in, in sectors that, that, that weren't as affected by that, by like mandatory vaccines, as workers and local councils still had to continue to provide essential services during lockdown, as, as uh, uh, you know, health and local government are our two big sectors in, in unison, our members were still campaigning on things like stopping um, outsourcing, campaigning to insource and get services back in again. And we had several really good successes during the past couple of years on this. Um, we've also been campaigning against fire and rehire because uh, we do see that even in public services. We've seen local authorities that have tried to use that and we've campaigned successfully against that in a number of areas. And now, uh, as the cost of living crisis begins to hit members hard, uh, one of the, the sort of, I suppose it's a more of an internal thing we've been doing in unison is we have our own, and we've had it for a number of years now, our own charity called There For You. Uh, we, we provide things like, uh, we provide loans, et cetera, uh, or give, give grants to members who are facing financial difficulties. We also have a school uniform grant that gets well used, I have to tell you, when, when term starts. Uh, but th this year, we've also had a winter fuel grant going out to people as we've seen energy prices continue to rise. And, that, and that's partly because, uh, not that we see ourselves at, at first and foremost as a charity, far from it, we're a fighting campaigning organisation, but we recognise that for our members, it's their whole life that matters. And we see ourselves very much as a family in unison. And so continuing to support our members and their communities is very important to us. Um, but even, you know, if you think about what's happening now, Unison will be there as we work with the TUC and our sister unions to fight against this crisis in, uh, in, in the economy, to fight against the, 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 the um, cost of living crisis that we're all experiencing at the moment. We'll be there, as, as, as Paul said, we're the biggest union. And I know that we can provide you know, the bodies to turn out to any events that we're organising, boots on the ground, as it were, uh, working with our sister unions and the TUC in the campaigns that I very much hope will be happening this, this spring and that we're already talking to the TUC about and uh, hopefully TUC, the TUCs across the three devolved uh, parts of the, of the UK, whether that's in demos and rallies in cities and towns across the country or it's a big event in two or three places, London or some other, big cities across the country, I can assure you we will absolutely be there. But even during this, uh, we've still been running major campaigns and successful campaigns, political and bargaining campaigns, whether that's against the police and crime bill in Parliament, uh, taking cases to the highest court. We still had some really brilliant wins in the senior, uh, you know, high courts and um, Supreme Court in, in this country on critical issues around workers' rights, uh, whether it's about fighting for national pay rates for outsourced workers, especially getting agenda for change rates for staff working in private contractors in the NHS. Uh, but during, the camp, during COVID, we also had some significant wins. We pushed the government to update their shielding guidance during the height of the pandemic to give additional rights to disabled workers. And I have to say, because I was involved in almost daily calls on this, we hassled the government into setting up an infection control fund in the care sector, and we made paying care workers full pay during sickness absence related to COVID the number one priority uh, in that. Now, did we get it delivered everywhere? No. Um, we reckon about one third of care workers still were it being paid full pay during sickness absence, even at the height of the pandemic. Um, I just touch a little bit on organising and recruitment. So when I, I've been General Secretary for just over a year, and when I was elected last year, 
I started several big projects across the union, focusing very much on member engagement, participation in the union, and on organising and recruitment, uh, particularly among underrepresented groups like our low paid women, women members and members in their community and voluntary sectors and the private sectors within Unison who perhaps weren't in big, well established branches. And trying to make sure that every member had a full voice within the union and was at front and centre of all the campaigns that we do. And there's a big recognition that we need to. Um, look at new ways of organising and, and new ways of dealing with um, recruitment and organising, especially from the lessons we've learned through the pandemic. So I'll be honest, last year, recruitment and retention figures were amazing. We had fantastic figures. Um, we made huge gains, especially in social care and schools. Uh, we set up direct mailing and email contacts with specific occupational groups. We have about 120,000 email addresses for social care members in Unison, and that's not all of them, but that, that's been a fantastic way of getting information out directly. We've moved more into digital organising and digital campaigning. Uh, we're holding webinars, motion-based conferences uh, on all online, and we've made huge use of our social media accounts, whether that's Facebook pages for specific groups, seeing hundreds of thousands of hits, especially on things like safety in schools. But it's been more difficult this year to sustain that level of increase that we've seen as we've seen more and more public sector workers leaving their jobs this year for, for kind of obvious reasons. They're tired, they're burnt out. So we are having a full review of our digital capacity. But what's really important is that we still need that face-to-face -face contact and visibility in workplaces. So as we move back to that, uh, we'll be looking very much to, to pick up that work again within workplaces. We've also just launched last week a big advertising campaign in unison about the cost of living crisis to back up more traditional methods. And we're launching a new Unison College this year with a new improved offer for members, but also one that's about um, turning members into activists. Uh, I'll just finish with this. It's never been more important for unions to fight back than it is this year, as inflation is likely to go up to the 8%, when pay will be nowhere near that. Who will fight this? It will be us in the unions. And when we see the Tories in Westminster making a mockery of the sacrifices that our members have made, who will demonstrate against them? Again, us. And when the Governor of the Bank of England says uh, employees shouldn't ask for, for more money, uh, who will speak up for working people and keep that fight going for decent pay? Of course, it will be us in the union to do it, nobody else. I am absolutely convinced that we are a positive force in society. No matter what the Tories or the right-wing press might say, we make positive changes that benefit everyone. So this is the year to fight back. This is the year to speak up, to take our members with us, but to take our communities and our non-union members with us as Paul said, we need to keep growing. So everyone in this call tonight, ask a non-union colleague or a family member or a friend to join a union. Because when you're in a union, you become part of the change that actually matters and makes a difference in this world. Thank you. Well, thanks, Christine. And thanks for a brilliant start to the, uh, uh, to the call. And let me just say thanks to you, but maybe more importantly, thanks to every single Unison member who joined the course of the pandemic as has worked so hard. <clears throat> in fact, every union member, uh, whether those people working in care homes and local councils, keeping the power on, um, I think we owe a, a big debt of gratitude to each and every single one of you. Now, spoiler alert, Christina mentioned a series of events that we're uh, planning for over the spring and the summer, and this will be a bit of a uh, world exclusive on this call, but I'm, I, I just ask you over the next week or so to watch this space, watch the TUC's website, watch our social feeds, uh, there'll be a whole range of national and local events that we'll be organising, everything from local town hall meetings to big uh, demonstrations. If you live within striking distance of Blackpool, uh, no pun intended, uh, we are hoping to organise uh, an event in Blackpool to coincide with the Conservative Party conference. Uh, and we're not there because of it's the fact it's the Conservatives, we're there because the best response to the cost of living crisis is Britain getting the pay rise it needs and deserves. So watch this space, lots of events coming from the TUC and unions over the spring and summer. 
So from key workers in the public sector, let's go to key workers in the private sector. I'm really uh, delighted to introduce our next speaker, who's Sarah Woolley, the General Secretary of the uh, of Bafawu, the Bakers Union. Uh, people have seen the inspirational work that uh, Bafawu have been doing around MAC strikes and supporting uh, young workers. But behind all of that work as well, I know that Sarah and her team have been keeping members safe throughout the pandemic. People had to go into work, whether they worked in a bakery or a food factory or a processing plant, people who literally made sure that there was food uh, on our shelves. So absolutely delighted to introduce Sarah. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Paul, and thank you to the TUC for the invitation to join. And I'm just hoping that my internet holds out because it's been very unstable for the last hour or so, which is typical when I'm, I'm that. Um, I want to start off by thanking each and every one of our reps for the work that they've done throughout deciding for recognition for being the key workers themselves and our members are and of course keeping our members safe unions cannot win for workers without our reps on the ground doing what they do best and i was thinking about what to say today um, the title of the event is every worker needs a union and, and being in the position that i'm now in in the bakers union of course i'm going to think and believe that trade unions are a vital part of our society it would be a little odd if I didn't. But I began thinking about comparisons of my introduction into the working world as a 16 year old in comparison to the introduction into the working world my son's looking at. And I, I think if I'm honest, I went a little greyer at the thought. It's a scary world of work for 16 and 17 year olds to be in, especially one with a general secretary for a, a, for a mum. And I wanted to, if I can, Paul, touch on a little on the comparisons between working in a unionised workplace and working in a non-unionised, going as far as an anti-trade union workplace and the importance of the collective. Because I know we're going to hear a lot about the different actions that's going on throughout the movement from others. I started work as a Saturday assistant at Baker's Oven that later became Greg's. The union has had a recognition agreement with Greg's for decades, which has, which has built over time built in protections such as no zero hours contracts, the lowest rate of pay being well above minimum wage, only under 18s receiving a slightly lower hourly rate, but still far above the minimum for that age group, premium pay on bank holidays if still worked, generous breaks, rigorous risk assessments, and more recently, the removal of the training rate, meaning that from day one, you're on a full hourly rate of pay for the job that you're doing. The company and the union have regular meetings at varying levels from local joint consultation meetings to national health and safety meetings. Reps have spoken to about changes and asked for advice on what may work in the workplace. For example, it was our retail reps that raised through the pandemic that members were struggling to make ends meet. And that led to the, the grab bag initiative that Greg's put in place where employees on a closing shift in the shop are able to get a pasty, a sandwich and a cake for a pound. Um, which is far cheaper than the discount that they would normally get. They come to us as a union at these different levels to talk about how a change may be received. And in general, though no organisation is perfect, like others, there are a few local rogue managers that don't understand why trade unions exist. But as a result of these regular conversations, Greg's isn't, in the grand scheme of things, a bad organisation to work for. If you compare this to a company like McDonald's, which has zero hours contracts, pay differentials that reflect the government ones, meaning if you're under 25, you would earn less than your colleague aged 26 doing the same job. And if you're under 18, even more so. A culture, it seems, certainly from our experience, of bullying and harassment and a lack of health and safety standards, leaving many employees able to identify others who work at McDonald's just from the burns on their arms and a reluctance to speak junior and a slapping organizer in the stars they are a world apart in fact there's a myth of stars a picture of our national president's face in them with a do not engage sign underneath after the strikes that we've had in the past the difference between these two companies is that one recognizes the worth of trade unions the training that we provide reps the knowledge the experience that we we have the industry 
to talk to members and face feedback criticism and ideas and is generally a safer but there is evidence that union has, which begs the courses about and that's kind of a long-term comparison of the of two very similar organizations that have a very different view of trade unions whilst that shows recognized trade union what's you keep coming back to is that a trade union is nothing with members and is strong when those members are active and act collectively that's what makes trade unions important. Okay, thanks, Sarah. And, and listen, thanks a lot as well for uh, battling on through some of the technical uh, issues there. But I mean, I think a brilliant compare and contrast between the experience of people in unionised workplaces and non-unionised workplaces. And we know, don't we, that it's not just about pay, although it's a big difference in pay. Uh, the pay premium for union members is something like £60,000 extra over the course of your working life but we know and sarah talked about the experience of mcdonald's you're safer in a union workplace a union workplace is more likely to be equal you're more likely to have a pension more likely to have access to childcare, and crucially you're more likely to have a, a voice on a job and a voice on the job means dignity at work as well so thanks to sarah and thanks sarah for all of the efforts again of you and your members during the course of the pandemic uh, and beyond and i have got no doubt that one day uh, McDonald's going to have to sit down and sign that recognition agreement with the Bakers Union. Uh, we've seen it in the past, haven't we? Ryanair swore they'd never recognise a union. Uber, who would have thought you, Uber would have recognised the union? I'm quite sure that at some stage uh, McDonald's will be sat down, hopefully with Sarah signing that recognition agreement. OK, our next speaker is Patrick Roach, Dr Patrick Roach, General Secretary of the NSUWT. And as well as being General Secretary of the NSUWT, Patrick's also Chair of the TUC's Anti-Racism Task Force. This is a a key piece of work really an initiative aimed at tackling the structural racism faced by black workers in the workplace at work but also let's be honest within our own movements as well and i talked before about the need for us to build a genuinely diverse and representative movement patrick is right at the forefront of that work patrick delighted you with us tonight over to you well, thanks very much, Paul. And um, uh, it's great to be here, colleagues, uh, adding um, the voice of the NSWT to Heart Unions Week, uh, because we all know that every worker needs a union. Um, our unions are on the front line, front line of defending uh, people at work. We've seen it through the pandemic, haven't we, colleagues? Um, it was our unions that kept workers safe. Every day, it's our unions that are demanding fair treatment, respect and justice for our members at work. That's what it means to be unionised. And I want to pay a special tribute to our workplace representatives, our workplace reps. They've been absolutely incredible um, during these past two years, always there for our members with advice and support and speaking up for our members at work. And as trade union members, we know that when we stand together, we are stronger. When we stand together, black and white, women and men, disabled and not disabled, we are stronger as a movement. That where we're divided, that those who exploit us or put at risk the safety of our members and our families, those people will be emboldened. So our unions are here for every worker, for every one of our members. And we know, of course we know, that we've got work to do. But I want to be clear that we as a movement are committed to taking the action that's needed to demonstrate that we're on the side of every worker. So that's why we're stepping up the work of the anti-racism task force of the TUC, campaigning to tackle racism at work, highlighting the need for action against outsourced and two-tier employment and to ban zero hours contracts, which we know, colleagues, we know disproportionately impacts on black workers. And our trade union campaigning is winning the case to outlaw fire and rehire practices. It's only a matter of time, colleagues. We're winning the arguments on institutional racism, despite the government's attempts to say that systemic institutional racism does not exist. And we're speaking out, colleagues, and we will be speaking out, including next month on UN Anti-Racism Day on the 19th of March, where we'll be calling out the government over its failure to tackle racism at work and the root causes of racism 
in our society. And I hope, colleagues, that everyone on this call will be at one of those rallies in London, in Glasgow, and in Cardiff. You know, our anti-racism task force is asking every union to step up, to step up our game in fighting for justice at work and in our communities, starting in our workplaces, making a difference in the fight for racial justice at work. But we know that we'll also have to address these issues locally and regionally in our communities, as well as in our workplaces. And colleagues, we are doing that as well as building our networks nationally and internationally. So we're asking members and activists to be a voice in your workplace, but also to be part of our collective voice in your communities, working with your regional TUCs, working together across unions, whether on a sectoral basis or across different sectors, to speak up on behalf of working people and families. Now, you know, with our anti-racism task force, we're demanding the change that we want to see in every workplace and in society at large. So in the last few months, we've agreed with unions an action plan for our movement, an action plan that says that we need to see fair pay agreements with employers. And we're setting out how unions can work to secure those agreements. We're saying that we need to see transparency in the pay system where employers are mandated to report on their race and disability pay gaps, as well as on their gender pay gap. And we're winning support across the board for our calls for those pay gap reports to be published. We're saying that we need to see unions stepping up our organizing efforts, ensuring that the voices of black members are heard in our decision-making at every level within our structures. And we're taking action as a movement to build a network of black reps and future leaders with a training and networking offer that's being rolled out right across the country. We need to see unions organizing black workers because the best place to be, if you're facing discrimination, harassment or abuse at work, the best place to be is in a union. But we're not only saying we wanna recruit more black members, we want to see unions opening the doors to those members and for more black members to be in leadership positions in our unions. So we've asked all unions to step up and to showcase how our movement is leading by example. We know that our diversity is our strength as a movement and it makes us stronger. So we're asking every union general secretary, every national executive, every branch and lay reps to think about what you can do what we can do together, colleagues, to secure racial justice in the workplace. And as trade union employers, we're also saying that our unions have a key role to play by being exemplar employers as well. And we're stepping up our organising and campaigning too, because when employers break the law, when they systematically treat black workers or other groups of workers less favourably, we have to use the law to hold them to account. That's why we've agreed to work with unions on strategic litigation, taking on bad employers. And that's why we campaign to secure the independent public inquiry into the government's handling of the pandemic. And now it's our job to ensure that we use that inquiry to hold the government's feet to the fire. And if the law isn't on our side, colleagues, if the law's not on our side, we're asking unions to use our industrial campaigning, workplace by workplace, employer by employer, to fight for racial justice for our members. That's what it means to be in a union. So through the task force, we're asking all union leaders to pledge to act, to, to take back the messages from the task force into their executives and to their black members and black staff, to have discussions to develop plans, to take action and to report on their progress and their successes. And colleagues, I hope that you'll all be part of those discussions. In my own union, the NSWT, that's precisely what we're doing. We've taken action by adopting a new racial justice strategy. We've developed our big conversation on racial justice, engaging with every one of our members, as well as up with our lay activists, our staff and our national executive to look at ourselves to see where we need to improve, where we need to do things differently, 
and also to where we can take forward campaigns that will deliver for our members. We've made racial justice training and training on gender equality mandatory for all of our executive and managers. We've published our race pay gap and we've published our action plan for addressing the issues that the, that, that has identified. And we've also developed and strengthened our engagement with our black staff and our black members with regular forums, consultations, research and training. And I'm really proud that as a result, we're recruiting more black reps, ensuring that our union is representative and inclusive of our membership at every single level. That's what it means to be in a union. But it's not just about what we do internally. It's about what we do on behalf of our members in their workplaces as well, campaigning against the cost of living crisis, because we know that the widening race pay gap and gender pay gap will mean that it's black teachers, it's women, it's disabled teachers who are being hit the hardest. And we're highlighting the injustices faced by our supply teacher members as agency workers. We're campaigning against discriminatory performance pay systems, which result in black workers being paid less. And we're speaking out on the issues of COVID and long COVID, because we all know too well the acute racial disparities that were faced by black workers during the course of the pandemic. Today, we've launched our Better Deal campaign because we want a better deal for our members, a better deal for teachers, a better deal on pay, a better deal on workload, and a better deal which ensures that the well being of all of our members is looked after, including action by government and employers to tackle racial injustice and everyday racism that our members tell us about. That's why those are issues central to the NHWT's campaign plan and to our bargaining priorities. That's what it means to be a union member. That's what it means to be part of our movement colleagues, to be on the side of every one of our members on the big issues that matter to them. So colleagues within the NHWT and on behalf of the Anti-Racism Task Force of the TUC, I look forward to working with you all on the important work that we have still got to do to secure racial justice at work. Solidarity, colleagues. Absolutely brilliant, Patrick. And I think that message comes across loud and clear. I mean, people can hear uh, we're, we're online, but the passion still comes through. And maybe just to say two things, Patrick, I know when you took on the chair of the Anti-Racism Task Force, you were absolutely adamant that what you didn't want was a piece of work that was another description of the problems that black workers faced. It was, what are we going to do about it? And I think you know, if we can take anything from Heart Unions Week and from your contribution there, wouldn't it be a brilliant legacy for that task force? It, every branch meeting that we had as a trade union movement, every union executive, the TUC General Council itself, actually looked like the workforce as a whole, actually represented the diversity of the workers that we're aspiring uh, to represent. Uh, so uh, absolutely with you on that, Patrick. But also, I, I think you just made a really strong point that, yes, we want the government to move on things like ethnicity pay gaps, but as a trade union movement, we're not waiting around for a conservative government to pass legislation. We can do some of this stuff in our workplaces, bargaining with our employers, standing up uh, for our members. And that industrial campaign is what makes us different from a think tank or policy wonks. We can do this stuff in our own workplaces with our own members and with our own uh, activists. So talking about industrial campaigning, I want to introduce our uh, next speaker. We've got two speakers left. Rachel Harrison from the GMB. Uh, Rachel represents one of the largest unions uh, in the country. I mentioned before the agreement that the GMB signed uh, with Uber that came on the back of the agreement they signed a couple of years ago with Hermes. We saw the GMB fighting back against fire and rehire in British Gas. And Rachel, I know, has been at the forefront of supporting and organising key workers in health and beyond during the pandemic. Rachel, absolutely delighted you could join us tonight. Over to you. Hi everybody uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all tonight on the first day of Heart Unions Week. Um, unfortunately my colleague Hazel Nolan was unable to join tonight so she does send her apologies. Um, I've worked at my union, the GMB, for 21 years and never more has the time been right for us to get back to the basics of union organising. After a decade of austerity and two years of a pandemic, government and employers are reluctant to award workers um, with fair pay and terms that they deserve. 
As a general union which represents workers in all industries and sectors, we have been involved in organising members right across the UK on issues that matter to them. The pandemic seriously hindered our ability to communicate with workers in our usual ways, and we were forced to think differently, not just about how we communicate and engage with members, but also how we operate as a union. What quickly became apparent was that our activist structures were not as strong as we had thought they were, and we take responsibility for that. We went from relying on face-to-face -face communications to quickly having to adapt to an online world, and we were very conscious that just because we were able to work from home, the majority of our members and activists were not able to, and they needed the backing of the unions more than ever, as we had to fight for PPE and health and safety, and risk assessments and testing and sick pay. And as we were locked out of the workplaces, it was the activists that were needed to deliver the messages. A reliance on social media platforms and emails alone just wasn't getting through to the workers. And we battled pandemic issues, which were fundamental health and safety importance, but they came to the detriment of other campaigns. We were simply unable to be everywhere that our members needed us to be. And there simply just aren't enough of us. And GMB Union's focus is now on how we make work better for our members. And we do this through collective bargaining and building reps and activist structures by empowering workers to fight for fair pay or improved terms and conditions. Local campaigns run by local activists. We need to listen to our members in their workplaces and empower and assist them to get organized, develop reps and leaders and provide them with the skills and tools to have the fight. Absolutely everything has to start in the workplace with you, with the workers, with the members on issues that matter to you. It should not be the norm that national unions do top-down campaigning. If the members aren't calling for it, then why are we? GMB can't guarantee that we will win every fight or every campaign that we take on. But what we can guarantee is that if our members think it's an issue and they want to take it on, then we will support them to strive for it. We all know that workers who are in trade union recognised workplaces have better pay, terms and conditions, safer working environments. But what about those who aren't? And what about those that don't have enough or even any elected reps? For those workers, it is down to us and you to organise by recruiting your colleagues and making them aware that things can be better within the workplace. It will make a difference, especially when you stand together. G GMB has been involved in many campaigns over the last year. Some of them alone and some of them involved in partnership working with colleagues from unions represented tonight on this panel. We've had wins and we've also had some campaigns that we didn't win. But regardless of outcome, the process of organising the membership in the workplace has been crucial. We may not have won all the campaigns, but we are now stronger in those workplaces and we're better organised so that next time we will be closer to securing victory. And workers in those workplaces feel more connected with each other and with their union, and they're more confident to ask and fight for what they deserve. In public services, we've seen a decade of real terms pay cuts forced on our key workers right across the sector. The very, the very people who were forced to endure pay freezes and cuts were the ones that we were applauding throughout the pandemic, but then they were quickly forgotten again when it came to pay awards. Without an industrial response, public sector pay may never recover. We are seeing people leaving their jobs in public services in the thousands. And as they head off into other industries and sectors who are rewarding staff more fairly, we are losing years of skills and experience in the public service sector. Last week, the Bank of England boss stated that hardworking people who had carried us through this pandemic did not deserve a pay rise and that they should swallow up the massive real terms cuts. Many of these same people are having to choose between eating and heating. And GMB has called on Mr Bailey to work for just one day as a carer before he talks again of wage restraint. In care, we've secured the real living wage for all care workers in Wales, but GMB is calling for £15 an hour as a minimum for all care workers everywhere because it's the least they deserve. And yet what we're actually seeing in care are national care providers draining the profits out of that system and leaving care workers on minimum rates of pay with no access to sick pay or other enhanced benefits. And as the final insult, care providers such as Barchester Healthcare are serving de-recognition notices on the unions. GMB is using Heart Unions Week to expose them for attacking their employees' rights and for taking away their voices. And we're making sure our members know how to fight back. 
sick pay continues to be an issue for workers in care. And Christina mentioned it earlier. GMB and other unions secured the government funding for sick pay during COVID. We know the failure to pay sick pay in, in care is the biggest infection risk there is. And the funding for this is still in place until March. And yet some employers have stopped paying it or chosen not to pay it at all. And the rest will follow in April. And we will once again see the return of poorly care workers attending workers they literally cannot afford not to do so. And in the NHS, GMB is calling for a significant increase in pay, which busts inflation and a restorative payment plan to restore lost earnings. And we're calling for emergency funding and a reform of the ambulance service and how it's being run as the current pressures have become unbearable for ambulance staff. And these campaigns are all being led by reps and activists right across the country in GMB. And without these issues being resolved, we'll continue to experience the staffing crises that we are. Workers in these sectors deserve better, but the only way we can help them is by organising them. The workers are the union. They are the leaders of the campaigns and only by them standing in solidarity with each other will we win. It's our job and our duty to do this. And when they do get organised, they will win. Look at what's happening in waste recycling and refuse collection services across the country. In Brighton and Hove, we've got drivers and loaders that took part in industrial action over pay and they won. And when they won, so did the care workers because they got an uplift in pay as a result. And in Samwell, we've got refuse collectors who took on the fight over bullying and health and safety concerns. And in Solihull, the bin contract is run by Amy, who are refusing to collectively negotiate on pay with the GMB. And our members have called for a ballot for action, which will end at the beginning of March. And in Wiltshire, the waste collection members have just voted for strike action. 98.4% of voted yes to action with an 85% turnout. The first day of action will be on the 28th of February. Now these actions are being led by the members. They are instilling the confidence in others to fight. And what we have seen is a ripple effect with workers in similar positions being empowered to do the same. We have private contracts being run for profits in hospitals across the country, driving down terms and conditions of colleagues working in the health services. One by one, we are organising them to fight for parity with NHS colleagues. In Croydon Hospital, G4S members are calling for action ballots to fight for sick pay, and they're backed by their clinician colleagues. And in St George's Hospital, mighty members are fighting for sick pay. They've got a protest planned for this week on Friday. In security, we've got GMB members that are being balloted on 5 to 7% increases in G4S. And, and at HMP Altcoast, G4S made an offer of 3%, which was massively rejected by the membership. And we now have a revised offer of 7% on the table. And our members in Yodel secured an improved pay award after a successful vote by the membership in favour of action. Members are now benefiting from between a £2.50 and a £3 per hour pay increase. And it was mentioned earlier, Uber, our members in Uber took the five and demonstrated that workers in the gig economy could be organised. They fought for their rights. They secured positive changes to employment terms such as um, minimum wages and holiday pay and access to pension plans. And we've now secured a recognition agreement which will benefit 70,000 drivers. So just to finish up, I'm calling on everybody, as we all are, who has taken the time to tune in tonight, make a commitment to ask at least one non-union member in your workplace to join the union. Why not also speak to your friends and family? Are they in a union? If not, why not? Tell them to join. Union members should inquire about the different activist roles. Not everybody needs to be a shop steward or a health and safety rep. Some people may choose to be active in their branch, be a workplace contact, hand out newsletters, be a ballot lead, a young members officer. There are so many ways you can get involved. And once you've joined, it's your union. Get involved. Look for opportunities to increase and diversify activism in your union. And why not start this week by checking out the Heart Union's events that are happening, offering your support where you can. And think about what you'd like to see change in your workplace how we can start to organise and build and help you achieve that change and make work better. Thank you. Fantastic, Rachel, and thank you for stepping in uh, at short notice uh, for Hazel. You talked about some of those brilliant GMB wins over the last few months, uh, Rachel. Every day winning ballots, winning disputes, 
making a difference. And I think that's reflected across the whole of the TUC family. Our membership overall has grown now four years on the trot, and it's grown because people have seen the difference that unions make in workplaces and beyond. I think the trick for us all now is to turn those small wins and those small membership gains into bigger wins and bigger membership gains. And one person who I know is definitely thinking big about winning those big victories is our last speaker, uh, Dr. Joe Grady of the UCU. Now, I think Joe is up in Scotland or has been up in Scotland today on the picket line. UCU members in 44 universities taking strike action on pay, on pensions, on equality, on workloads. I can't think of a better person to close off our discussion tonight, Joe. Over to you. Thank you. It's no pressure. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm in a hotel. I've just come back uh, to Yorkshire from Glasgow. And yeah, it's a pleasure to actually be asked to speak about um, things that our unions have been doing, particularly in the last two years. Um, I think unlike a lot of other people this evening, I haven't made any notes because I could talk forever about things that you two have been doing that I'm absolutely delighted with. And I'm going to share some of them um, with everyone because I think the two things, if I was going to be making a pitch to someone as to why they should join any union or be joining our union UCU, it would be that during this pandemic, we've done many things. But I think two of the things that have really resonated with people when they've been watching our union is we have saved jobs and we know that we've saved lives. Um, I'll cover the jobs bit first um, because I think that there's a number of branches I could talk about, but I'm going to talk very briefly about our University of Liverpool branch, our University of Chester branch and Harriet Watt University branch. All three of those branches during this pandemic have been presented with huge redundancies, redundancies that when they landed on those branch reps were presented as a done deal, were presented as the only possible option to an economic reality that we as a union did not recognize. Bear in mind that the higher education sector has um, over 46 billion pounds worth of reserves. Um, the expenditure on staff as a proportion of overall income has dropped from the mid 50s to the mid 40s of that income. Um, that it is staff that do the bread and butter, whether that's teaching, uh, keeping the library running, keeping labs running, doing the work in offices, or, you know, the porters and the cleaners and the catering staff. To be told at any point that there isn't money for you but there's money for six figure salaries of vice chancellors that people don't even know exist is egregious to be told there's no money for you uh, in a pandemic when literally the business of the university could not be conducted without all of those people um, is beyond shameful. So those three branches that I said at the beginning, Liverpool, Chester, Harriet, Watt, just three of our branches that during this pandemic took on um, the type of management that doesn't really think twice before serving uh, notices for redundancy and, and won. Um, our Harriet Watt branch, uh, they were one of the early branches that were involved in redundancy negotiations. Um, they had to ballot, all of these branches had to ballot. They won ballots during a pandemic when obviously many of us were working from home. So we had to conduct a, different, a totally different type of organising very quickly. Um, the University of Liverpool, you'll probably be familiar with because they took extended strike action uh, in, in addition to the, the union calling a boycott on that university um, and saves jobs. And the University of Chester um, has massively increased its density in the last 12 months and actually managed to save every single job um, that was listed for redundancy on the basis of a strike ballot without actually taking any strike action at all. So these are not just saving jobs during a really difficult period, but also giving people a sense of control and power in what was a really destabilizing time, in what was a moment when university managers probably thought they could come for and take um, whatever they wanted. And I think if I was gonna make, really make a pitch to people as to why you should uh, heart your union on any day, let alone Valentine's Day, it's that it will transform you. And in doing so, it will transform your life. There is nothing more transformative than realizing that when you stand together and act together, 
you can win together and what that truly means to you as a person and to you as a group of people. And, and I think especially, you know, in this moment in time, I'm not quite sure where everyone will be in the UK watching this call, you know, but the kind of relentlessness of um, the Westminster government just throwing, you know, grenades at people to feel that actually um, the good guys can win and that you can be part of that and that you can bring other people on board and that you can grow something and that you can save jobs. And, you know, particularly in universities, people work together for years. They become part of a, of a community um, was really powerful for all three of those branches. So there have been other redundancies and jobs that have been saved during the pandemic. Um, but all three of those branches took slightly different tactics, were up against slightly different managers um, and, and managed to, you know, save um, various people from losing their jobs and leaving those communities. Incredibly, incredibly important. Um, and then obviously during the pandemic, um, you know, I think it's very clear that as a union, we were responsible for saving lives. Um, you might be thinking kind of saving lives in terms of it would have been UCU members who may have been the scientists behind uh, the vaccine or behind any of the other kind of medical interventions that you've seen. And that is undoubtedly true. Um, but I'm actually thinking about saving lives in terms of the very strong position on health and safety that this union took. Um, that we recognised long COVID from the very beginning of having completely damaging and debilitating effects on people, um, that we were clear that keeping educational institutions open were, um, you know, would lead to uh, mass um, infections of COVID uh, and needed to be moved online. Uh, I take no pleasure in uh, saying that we were proved right, but I think the early interventions of UCU to ensure that um, teaching and sort of mass events were moved online was key. And again, I'm gonna, gonna shout out to two UCU branches. Uh, one, Northumbria University UCU, who were the first union branch of any union in the UK to run a successful COVID health and safety ballot. They ran that ballot back in the autumn of 2020 after I want to say 750, but as I said, I didn't, I didn't write any notes for this, but um, 750 students, I believe, in one week tested positive for COVID and only one in 10 of those um, people, and they were th this was a group of students, um, were symptomatic. So this was huge and it was clear that the, the virus was sort of out of control. Uh, that branch moved to a petition, um, passed a motion at a local meeting, uh, and then move very rapidly to a quick ballot. I think their ballot was three weeks. And within three weeks, um, they'd already got a lot of stuff moved online and then kept things online for the remainder of that term. So we had very few as far as we were able to keep track. Um, I think more we, we unfortunately did have some members die during this pandemic and we remember them all. But we are convinced that there would have been way more fatalities had our union not taken the position that it did. Um, we had another branch, our prison branch, uh, Novus, who likewise conducted a ballot. We were really concerned about health and safety, not just for our members, but actually for the students that they were teaching in um, prisons about health and safety. Uh, that was a very long drawn out dispute. But again, that branch was successful, doubled its density during a pandemic, organising in some of the hardest conditions, um, you know, with employers that are really um, quite draconian perhaps compared to what some of us are used to and just showing yet again that people can do these things when they work together and act together and that branch the Novus prison branch again I think is a really strong branch now it was strong before um, but remains so um, so there are two things and I think that there are two things that um, really stand out in the last two years of things that we've had to contend with as a union we've had to adapt uh, we've had to make sure that we organize differently and we've been ultimately successful. But I just want to say a few more things before I kind of wind up and hand back to Paul, because in addition to those hugely challenging circumstances, our union has also been doing the day to day work of protecting pay, fighting to keep pensions um, and taking really important steps to start organizing on issues that perhaps traditionally and this you know goes back to what Patrick was saying about race to start organizing and taking issues seriously that perhaps unions haven't been so good on. And for us, that means uh, looking at the way in which we represent and organize against, represent members and organize against sexual violence. So, you know, in terms of protecting pay, 
Uh, you may have seen, particularly if you're London based, we had a lot of our FE colleges who were taking strike action, uh, won, won really good pay deals compared to what was on the table beforehand, uh, and they deserve a shout out. Depending on where you are in the UK at the minute, you will have probably seen a UCU picket line today. Um, we're in, currently involved in a pensions dispute in higher education, um, a 35% cut to the pension scheme there, um, and we'll be making it almost impossible for anyone who hasn't been in that scheme for a considerable amount of time to have a decent retirement income. And this is in addition to another dispute that will um, uh, resume next week, which is again about pay but it's also about gender, ethnicity and disability pay gaps. It's about burnout workloads. Um, and I think, you know, to go back to one of the points of this call about organising and how we build the union is, you know, the more of us there are, the more we can win. Um, because however we think about trade unions and, you know, I was talking earlier about how they can enhance and change our lives. And this is true, but also industrial uh, relations industrial action is a numbers game and if you want a hundred percent of what you're fighting for then the best way to get it is to have a hundred percent participation from the people that could be taking part that doesn't mean you have to wait until you get to hundred percent to start doing anything of course it doesn't and you know building and winning things along the way draws and attracts people to the union and that's one of the reasons that we as a union are really keen to take issues that maybe haven't always been seen as industrial issues just as seriously. So um, we have been doing a lot of work on how we need to combat and, and tackle sexual harassment and violence in education. I know other unions have been doing this in the sectors that they work in. Sarah was talking earlier, and I know that the Bakers Union have done loads on this in the hospitality sector. Um, we are currently in the process of um, changing our legal um, representation towards members that are coming to us for representation and, and help and assistance um, who have been um, survivors or involved in any form of sexual harassment or violence because we know as a union uh, the movement has not done well enough on this in the past and if we want to attract people to our unions, if we want them to think of safe spaces, uh, spaces that they can join in and rely upon, then we do have to really, I think, address places where we haven't worked for people before. So one of the things we were asked to do in this call is think about those non-unionized people in your workplace, um, how you can reach out to them, how um, if we're gonna lean into a Valentine's theme, how you can romance them with collectivism and uh, really show them what the union is all about. And I think, you know, depending on what your union is doing, have that, for instance, have they done anything on sexual violence? Are they doing anything on those equality pay gaps that matter to you? One of the questions I always want is if a UCU member sees that there's a problem in their workplace, that they don't look to the management to set up some sort of working group, that they look to the union. Well, what can the union do about that? How, if I get together with other people in the union, can we start a working group on it? And there might not be anything in the democratic structures of your union that currently works for you or works for the group of people that you want to involve in this organizing. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. But that means that you then have to work within the union to make them take seriously the issue that's important to you. Our union is doing this with casualization. You know, those sort of members have not always been seen as central members of our union, but they are now. And I think that then, you know, is the second sort of organizing call of this call. So not just how are you going to reach out to those non-unionized people, but how are you going to actually connect with them? You know, rather than seeing them as the enemy who should be in the union, well, why aren't they? How could we diversify the union so that those people feel at home as well? You know, not everybody wants to come to the usual meetings. Um, democratic structures are often really clandestine to people. How do we welcome newcomers? How do we ensure that we don't kind of gatekeep that experience means one thing over another and put people off. So I think moving into those spaces that people care about, but we maybe haven't always seen as industrial is key. Organizing the whole worker, talking about issues that people um, want to see change um, and really making the union a space where people feel they can have those conversations. Because I think it's only really through having those conversations that we reach out to new people, but also we start organizing in, in areas that a key. Um, so I'm going to hand over back to you. But what I would say is um, UCU is on strike all this week, next week and the week after. It's 44 universities this week. It increases next week when our dispute goes up um, to our other dispute. If you uh, want to give the gift of 
solidarity in the form of a financial donation, feel free to Google UCU Fighting Fund and chip in. And uh, thanks for having me, Paul. Bye. Brilliant, Joe, and I think a, a really good way to close off tonight's discussion. I, I just want to pick up that fundamental point you made, Joe, about non-members and about how we need to build our unions around those workers and the issues that matter to them, rather than expecting somehow them to mould themselves to fit our unions the way that we are currently at the moment. Uh, listen, I want to thank Joe, but I want to thank each and every one of our fantastic speakers. Uh, we'll get some of those videos up on our, our website and social feeds uh, over the course of the next couple of days. Thank everybody who joined the call. Big thanks actually to Tanya and Anna in the TUC staff team who set up tonight's call. Um, and I'm sure they are busy if they haven't already just typing in uh, a couple of web links so you can get onto the Heart Union's sort of website and uh, uh, share what you're doing during the course of this week. Final, final reflection from me. I mean, I, 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 um, I've I been a trade unionist for over 30 years, which is frightening when I think about it. But I am proud of every single one of our TUC unions. And I'm proud of every single person, actually, the people who are on this call, who put their hands up in workplaces and decide to become activists, who do the heavy lifting for our movements uh, in workplaces up and down the country. And I think we should be proud of the stuff that we do every day, not just Valentine's Day or Heart Unions Week, uh, but the work that we're doing every single day. My personal Heart Unions moment this year or last year came when I had the privilege to go down to the Southwest in Somerset and meet with a group of community uh, union members who were taking strike action against fire and rehire uh, in Clarks. Those people were out on strike for eight weeks. Eight weeks, people who'd never been on strike before, out on strike for eight weeks to kick back fire and rehire. And they were successful. Fire and rehire got took off the table. Pay cuts got took off the table. The company had to come back and negotiate their union um, uh, 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 the, which is what they should have done right from the start. And I've been on demonstrations with literally hundreds of thousands of people uh, as part of this movement. But I, I, I honestly can't say I was any prouder than I was work, uh, walking with those 70-odd community members of 500 trade unions through that little market town uh, in the southwest because it just demonstrated the power of the union. That's what we do every single day. We give people dignity at work. We make the bosses sit up uh, and take notice and listen to them. So heart unions tonight, heart unions every single day uh, of the week. I hope you have a good rest of the evening. Uh, I'm off to watch some rubbish on the telly and put my feet up. Have a good night, everybody. Take care. Oh, and Joe, best wishes and solidarity to every UCU member as well. And remember to get those donations into the Fighting Fund. Take care, everyone. Bye now.